Hello everybody and welcome back to another anatomy tutorial. Today we're going to be looking at the bones of the wrist as well as looking at the alignment of the wrist on a wrist radiograph. We'll look at the three main projections that make up our wrist series, namely our AP view, our oblique view, and our lateral view or lateral projection that's really good when assessing alignment of the wrist. Let's start by having a look at our AP view. We can see the carpal bones lie between our metacarpals of the hand and our radius and ulna of the forearm. Our radius has this broad distal portion here and our ulna has a narrow distal portion. That's opposite to what we saw in the elbow where the ulna is the broad portion and the radius has that small radial head in the annular ligament. You can see that the carpal bones are formed in two separate rows. We have our proximal row, four bones in the proximal row of the carpals, and our distal row here. Now many of you would have learned a mnemonic when trying to remember the names of these bones and I encourage you to go a step further here and try and remember the bones by their shapes and their relationship to other carpal bones within the wrist. In order to be good at assessing wrist radiographs you really need to understand what normal looks like. What is the normal morphology of each bone and what is the normal relationship with other bones within the wrist. So let's start by naming the proximal row. We'll start laterally. Now this is our lateral side. We can see our thumb in the anatomic position is lateral. We know that our thumb is on the same side as the radius. An easy way to remember this is that your thumb can do a radial movement, so it's on the same side as the radius. So our proximal row, lateral bone, is our scaphoid bone. One of the most important bones to look at when looking at a wrist radiograph. You can see our scaphoid bone, scaphoid meaning boat in Latin, is shaped like this. It actually heads from proximal to distal. It heads from posterior to anterior. It has this anterior tilt and we're going to see that on our lateral radiographs. And the fact that it tilts so much in the wrist means that it superimposes itself and makes it quite difficult to assess this distal portion well. But we really need to be able to trace the cortex of the scaphoid bone ensuring that the no fractures is a really common fracture site of the scaphoid. Then medial to our scaphoid is our lunate bone, lunate meaning moon shaped. You'll see on the lateral view that the lunate bone is crescent shaped, like moon shaped, and it actually cups the capitate above it. Then more medial to our lunate is our triquetrum, our three-cornered bone. It's got this triangular shape. And just anterior to that triquetrum is our pisiform, which means P-shaped. It's technically a sesamoid bone. It lies within our flexor carpi ulnaris tendon here. And there's our pisiform, which again lies anterior to that triquetrum. Then our distal row of carpal bones will start now medially and head our way laterally. You can see our hamate bone here. And our hamate bone is quite unique. It's got a projection of bone that we can see we're catching end on here called the hook of the hamate. Then lateral to the hamate is our main bone, our capitate bone. Capitate meaning head shaped. You kind of see a head shape here, but the easy way to remember this, it's the biggest central bone, the main bone, the capital bone. It's our capitate bone. Then we have paired bones here. We've got our trapezoid bone and our trapezium bone. Many people remember trapezium under the thumb. It's a good way to remember it. But we also have our triquetrum. So you, some people get confused by naming this a triquetrum. So the best way to remember that is that our thumb and our scaphoid trap the two bones between it. Trapezium. When we were to fall, this is be trapped between the scaphoid and the thumb. So our trapezium and slightly medial to that, our trapezoid bone. Then you'll see that there's no actual bones in this space above the ulna. And this is what's known as our triangular fibrocartilage complex. What it does is if we were to put pressure on our wrist, say doing a handstand, it would divert some of that pressure away from this thin ulna into the radius here, this broad base of the radius. We don't want direct pressure onto this ulna. Now it's made up of many structures, but the main components are our ulna carpal collateral ligament, our ulnomeniscal humilog, which is a triangular shaped piece of cartilage here. And then we've got a triangular fiber cartilage disc proper here, which makes up this triangle shape here. We mustn't see bones floating within the space. We want to see a good space here. So let's move on to our oblique view. And one of the major advantages of the oblique view is looking at our scaphoid bone. Can you see our scaphoid bone heading here? 
You can see how from the proximal portion to the distal portion, the scaphoid bone heads anteriorly. This is our anterior, this is our posterior. Next to the scaphoid is our lunate bone. You can see that crescent shape like that, our lunate bone, which is cupping our capitate there. Then medial to our lunate bone, we've got our triquetrum here. And our triquetrum, you can see just anteriorly to that, there's our pisiform. It's quite difficult to see on this projection. Our hamate bone is in our distal carpal row, most medial bone with our hamate hook, which is quite difficult to see on this projection. And then also our capitate bone here, sitting within that cup of the lunate. We have our trapezoid bone, as well as our trapezium bone that's under the thumb. Now let's move on to our lateral projection and try and identify some of the bones. We can see our ulna bone here and our radius heading out distally there. The easiest bone to identify in this view, at least for me, is the lunate bone because we can see that crescent shape there heading down and articulating with the radius. Now if I go back two slides to our AP view, you can see our radius, the distal articular surface here is kind of scalloped, two separate fossa there. The first that articulates with our scaphoid and the second that articulates with the lunate bone. You can see how the lunate is actually slightly more proximal than our scaphoid bone. So on our lateral view, when we're looking at it, our lunate bone comes just below our scaphoid there and cups like that, articulating with our radius. Our scaphoid bone heads from posterior to anterior as it heads more distally. We can see our scaphoid bone projecting anteriorly here, wrapping its way around like that. You can follow the cortex of it there. And the more radiographs you look at, the better you're going to be at outlining these bones. Now we can see in our lunate is our capitate. If we follow the capitate round, it should be sitting nicely within the lunate. If we've got dislocation there, you'll see that it, this ball-in cup kind of view won't be there. The lunate will either be facing forward or facing posteriorly. You can see here our pisiform anteriorly. And a good marker for whether a lateral is a true lateral is by trying to get this anterior surface of the pisiform to lie between the anterior surface of our capitate bone and the anterior surface of our scaphoid bone. So here maybe we've got a little bit too much supination and it's for that reason that we don't see our triquetrum sticking out posteriorly very well here. Normally we can see the back or the posterior portion of that triquetrum sticking out. And here we can see our trapezium here as well as our trapezoid. It's quite difficult in these projections to outline those individual bones. It's quite difficult again to see our hamate bone in our distal row of the carpal bones. So another thing to appreciate here is that our carpal bones aren't like a brick wall where they're stacked perfectly in a flat line on top of one another. They actually are quite concave anteriorly. They cup forward. That's because we've got loads of flexors running through the front of our wrist here and we need to provide space for those tendons to run through as well as our median nerve and arteries to run through. So we need to create some space and that's what's known as our carpal tunnel. Now this isn't a very common view to do of the wrist, but it really gains an appreciation for that concavity in the wrist. This is the anterior surface of the wrist here. We can see our thumb on this side and below our thumb is our trapezium. Our trapezium projects anteriorly like that. You can see how it sticks out of the wrist. On that same side in our proximal row is our scaphoid bone. Here is our scaphoid. So on this side, the lateral side, we've got two bones projecting anteriorly. We've seen how the scaphoid projects anteriorly and our trapezium. So scaphoid and trapezium are here. On the other side, we've got the hook of the hamate bone in our distal row, as well as our pisiform, our P-shaped sesamoid bone that project anteriorly as well. And we have a retinaculum that connects these anterior structures together and provides a tunnel, a carpal tunnel here for the structures of the wrist to run through. So you can see how that concave shape allows for this space to be formed. We don't want tendons having to go over bones in direct contact. And as we move our wrist like that, would then give us a tendinopathy or a tendinitis by those tendons having to rub over the bones. This provides a tunnel for those tendons to move freely. In the middle here would be our capitate and below that would be our lunate bone. Here would be our triquetrum behind the pisiform bone.
So let's move on to another view that you may see within your practice. And this is an ulnar deviation view. They've got the patient to move their hand like that. And that, what that does is it brings our scaphoid up and round and allows us to look at the length of the scaphoid. You saw in our AP view, the scaphoid, as it goes forward, it projects over itself. We get superimposition of the scaphoid on itself. Here, as we only deviate, we bring that scaphoid round and we can see the whole of the scaphoid there. Now, why the scaphoid is really important is because as our radial artery comes round, it gives off a branch towards the scaphoid. And we've got that branch then supplying the distal portion, the waist, and the proximal portion of the scaphoid. If we were to fracture within the waist or the proximal portion of the scaphoid, we don't have a dual blood supply here, and we can get avascular necrosis in this proximal portion of the scaphoid. Again, as we head more proximally, the chance of avascular necrosis increases and the chance of mole union when we fracture this scaphoid bone increases as we head in proximally. We can see here that the scaphoid has a distal pole and a proximal pole, and that's separated by what's known as the waist of the scaphoid. This is our most common site for fractures in an adult. So it's really important to see the integrity of the cortex around that portion. If pain doesn't allow a patient to do that, we can take an angled view, a 30 degree angled view at the scaphoid as well to give us that end on look at the scaphoid. So now we've covered the actual bones within the wrist. Let's look at the alignment of the wrist. Now, the first thing that you want to do is assess the space between the wrist bones themselves. And what we want is a generally even space between the bones. And again, the bones aren't laid like bricks on top of one another with perfect spacing when we look at a particular view. The bones have formed this complex shape around one another. So some of the spaces, like between the trapezium and the trape trapezoid bone, we're not going to see that space very well. But the spaces that we can see, this distal row um, articulating with our metacarpals, as well as the spaces, say, between our scaphoid and our capitate here, we can follow them all the way around, make sure that we have even spaces. We've not got obliteration of those spaces or expansion of those spaces. We can see here that this is normal. Our spaces are even. We haven't got any disruption of the spaces there. We can then look at what's known as the carpal arcs of the wrist. We have a carpal arc here coming along the proximal border of our proximal carpal bones here. And we should see a smooth arc forming all the way around. If we've got fractures or dislocations, we could have disruption or step up or step down deformities of this carpal arc. We can then look at our distal row. We can see there is a nice smooth arc between the capitate and our hamate there. Some people also continue the arc between the trapezium and trapezoid bones, making sure that that space is consistent right the way through the wrist. Then we can move on and look at what's known as our radial inclination. Now I'm going to draw on this slide and we can see where we would measure the angles here in the radius. So if we were to take our radial bone here, our radius, and draw a perpendicular line to the shaft of the radius, we can then draw a line along that articular surface there and measure this angle here. That's what's known as the radial inclination angle. Now that angle should be between 20 and 25 degrees. If we are dealing with something in the order of less than 15 degrees, we should really suspect some form of distal radial fracture here where we've lost that angle within the radial shaft. That's known as radial inclination. If we have a, an angle that's more than 25 degrees, then we could be dealing with a deformity known as Madelung's deformity. So now we've looked at the radial inclination on an AP view. We can also look at the volar radial inclination, our volar surface here, anterior surface. Now when we look at the radius here on our AP view, you can see how the scalloping of that end of the radius here, allowing for articulation with the lunate and the scaphoid, creates an articular surface here. And then we have this radial styloid heading upwards. When we're looking at our lateral view, trying to get our volar inclination, we want to look at this articular surface here when measuring the volar inclination. So here we can draw again a line perpendicular to the shaft of our radius. And we can see here is the articular surface of that radius there. So that is the angle we measure. We don't follow the radial styloid up here and measure the angle that way. We want to measure this angle here. And again, we want that angle to be between 10 and 20 degrees. A disruption in that angle, we need to look for pathology, reducing or increasing that angle.
The next thing we can look at is what's known as ulnar variants. We're looking at the radial articular surface and we want to look at the radial ulnar joint here at the variation between the radial surface and the ulnar articulating surface. We want the difference between these two surfaces to be less than 2.5 millimeters. If the ulna is deviated this way, it's known as positive ulna deviation. If it's deviated proximally, it's called negative ulna deviation. There are multiple things, including fractures, that can cause the ulna variance to change, either positive ulna variance or negative ulna variance. Next, we're going to look at the lateral view to figure out our alignment of the wrist. Again, we can outline our lunate bone here. We can see that our capitate sits nicely within our lunate. Let me try to get the capitate accurately here. And we want the capitate, the lunate, our metacarpals, and our radius to be nicely stacked on top of one another. We can have this balling cup disrupting when we have dislocation of that lunate. So it's really important to see that capitate sitting within the lunate, and you want this line to be generally well aligned, well stacked on top of one another. And the last piece of alignment that we're going to look at is also involving the lunate. So let me draw an outline of this lunate. I'm drawing this with my mouse, so I'm not so accurate. Here we go is our scaphoid bone that we looked at earlier. Coming around, there's the bottom of our scaphoid, coming all the way around like that. You can see that our lunate is upright, and we can draw a perpendicular line through our lunate here. Let me try and draw this straight. Draw a perpendicular line through our lunate. We can then draw a line through the shaft of that scaphoid bone. You can see how the scaphoid goes from posterior to anterior here, so we want to draw a line like that. And this angle here between our lunate and our scaphoid should be between 30 and 60 degrees. We don't want that scaphoid to have moved forward like this, or we don't want a fracture within the neck of the scaphoid that mull aligns the lunate and the scaphoid. So there we have it, a whistle-stop tour through the bones of the wrist, as well as mentioning some of the things you want to look at in terms of alignment within the wrist. So I hope this has helped. My encouragement to you is go and learn the bones by name and by shape, rather than learning a mnemonic to remember the order of the bones. And just one thing before we go, I've created a monthly newsletter where I share some tips and tricks for exams, share interviews with radiologists who are the best in their fields, as well as sharing with you what's new in radiology, things that are interesting me in radiology, and showing you what resources I use when trying to learn radiology. So if that's something that you would like, I've left a link in the description. Go ahead and sign up. It's free. So that's all. I'll see you all in the next video. Until next time, goodbye, everybody.